Hi, everybody. Thanks for tuning in to The Envelope Live. I'm Michael Ordonia. I cover film, television, and pop culture for the Los Angeles Times, believe it or don't. You have just seen the pilot episode of Shining Veil, vale, the star's horror comedy that has been likened to The Shining, but funny. And to explain why, we have with us three of the key people behind the series, starting with co-creator and showrunner Jeff Astroff, who has written and or produced many shows, including The New Adventures of Old Christine, Veronica's Closet, and an unheralded little show called Friends. It was while working on Friends that he met the eventual star and producer of Shining Veil, vale, Courtney Cox, who plays Pat Phelps on the show. You might recognize her from a famous Bruce Springsteen video and another well-known blend of horror and comedy, The Scream franchise. And last, but obviously not least, we have Greg Kinnear, who plays Terry Phelps in Shining Vale, and whom you've seen pretty much everywhere, including on Talk Soup, Rake, and in his Oscar-nominated performance in As Good As It Gets. Jeff, Courtney, Greg, welcome here. Thank you all for coming out with us today. Hey, Hi there. Hi. I feel like Greg's headshot is the oldest of all of them. Am I wrong, <laughs> Greg? Sure. Was that your was that for your college yearbook? Yeah. <laughs> you know, I was hoping uh, I was going to give you that headshot to have you consider me being a grandfather in season two of Shining Vale. So I'll, I'll slip you that. The show. No, no, no. You're a beautiful man. Yeah, I, I think uh, Greg has Paul Rudd disease where he doesn't age, right? <laughs> uh, do you, so anyway, when you know TRD, uh, uh, let's talk about the uh, the roots of, of this show. And and I know you've had to answer this question somewhat, but for our, our viewers, um, Jeff, um, you've spoken elsewhere about uh, co-creator Sharon Horgan's pitch for the show, The Shining as a comedy, and one of her one of the key elements to it being the uh, the similarity between behavior associated with the. Uh, midlife crisis or, or menopause and demonic possession. <laughs> um, yes. You had, you had a quote somewhere else where you, you said uh, the studio hated the idea until you said it was Sharon Horgan's and they thought it was brilliant. Uh, so there's something to that though, right? I mean, if this were a man's idea, it might be taken a little differently. Um, what, what do you uh, think of that? I have, well, only women's ideas are good. And in every pitch, I'm going to only say they come from Sharon. Uh, yes, it was very, very funny. You know, uh, a lot of the, the development executives at Warner Brothers, where I've been for, you know, a, a long time, uh, all of them were women. And when I said this, because the thing that really sold me on this, I wanted to do uh, genre bending. And when, you know, when I really, it was like, I wanted to, the hook of it was, you know, Sharon's discovery that the symptoms of, uh, you know, of, of, demonic possession and depression are the same and that women are more likely than men to have both. And when I pitched it, they said, you know, we know that's not who you are, Jeff, but when you say that, it's very, very offensive. <laughs> and I said, Sharon Horgan's idea. And they said, what, let us finish. We love the idea. And, um, but, but I did, I did make it a point though, because it is, you know, I, I write what I know and I know about, you know, a writer's block and I'm very, very blessed to have a long line of, of, of mental illness on my maternal side. Um, and, uh, you know, our family produced two sitcom writers, so you could imagine, uh, what that was like growing up. Um, but, um, you know, I, I made sure that I had a lot of women, uh, you know, including Sharon, but all my directors were women, all my writers were women. And, and I wanted that, that strong point of view, just because I, it's, you know, I, I wanted to make sure that, uh, we had that, um, point of view really, really solid. So, cause I like writing what I know and, and, uh you know, having the support, not, not only just to have uh, women, like you said, but with Sharon on board, but I think it's important to have that voice and for things I don't have access to. Mm -hmm. uh, Courtney and Greg, how, how did you feel about that as that idea as being central to the show? Um, I mean, did you, did you feel that the, there was something authentic in that or that it would just be a comic premise? Uh, I felt it was going to, I mean, there was just, um, I felt like it was going to be central to the show, but also a lot to play. And um, I mean, I could go on about how I love my character so much and how you know, she's so multifaceted and going through so many changes. But um, I thought that was central to the show. Greg, what did you think before I just keep talking? Wait, no, go on. You said you can go on about how much you love it. And then you <laughs> stopped going on. Well, I may go on about my character, but um, oh, okay. I... <laughs> 
<laughs> and how great Jeff is. Well, I, I uh, didn't. I, I, hold on. Why break cut that off? When I read it, um, you know, I thought I certainly thought it was funny, and and it did have a, 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 an un, you know kind of a a very specific tone to it. Um, and it really was, uh, you know, I talked to Jeff and, and, and Sharon, um, I honestly, you know, I mean, I think part of this has, has been an evolution, um, from the pilot. We made this, you know, the pilot, we had a little break and then we went into the series and I feel like, um, you know, they did an incredible job of, of just digging and refining as we went along and, and kind of, uh, uh, you know, uh, the, it was very, very, um, it was a great discovery as we went forward and kind of finding this show because, it, you know, too much comedy and it kind of, I don't, it, it, I don't think it succeeds on that. And, and yet, um, it, you know, it's certainly not a drama or a straight up horror show. So I think the convergence of, a, of, of kind of a few different angles, including the mental health that Courtney just mentioned and some of those things, uh, for those all to come together um, is, is really hard. And, uh, you know, credit to the, the writing team. And, um, and also, I felt like the casting, we really had a great group of people. We had a little rehearsal time. Um, I had never, I did work with Courtney in my one episode of, of well, I did in one episode of Friends, but I never actually worked with Courtney. Um, she, she signed, made sure that didn't happen, but, uh, but we actually, um, None of the scenes I were thought, shot together in this show either. This is, that's really the technical <laughs> achievement. It's going to get editing away. We, we really, uh, I, I adore her and, uh, we created, a, I think, in this family, a, a real dynamic uh, with the kids. We have two, you know, the kids are fantastic in the show. And so I, I think the casting really helped a lot of it too, but it's been great fun to do. I, I have to tell you that I've, I've been quoted as saying this a long time is, is that writing is a hundred percent casting. I mean, you, hmm. I've, I've worked on, you mentioned my, uh, you know, my two shows, Veronica's Closet and Friends, which had the, really the same writers on them. And, you know, I think so, you know, and we've all had, um, this is, this is by far, um, you know, obviously this is a very uh, top line cast uh, from Roxy on up or maybe on down, but um, everybody is, is, is really great and the discovery. And we, we saw that the first day on, on set and it's, you know, now writing it is, um, I just kind of let the characters kind of write it in my head and uh, maybe I have you know, that same kind of thing that Pat does, but I, I uh, let the characters just write it because their voices are so clear and their attitudes are so clear and it's uh, it's very, very fun. So what you're saying is you're haunted by Courtney Cox. She shows up and takes over and, and makes you I don't think, I think that's implied in everything I say. <laughs> so, yes. uh, I, I want to get into how the uh, the characters have evolved, but uh, first, uh, just conceptually, I want to get back to the, the notion of The Shining as sort of framework for the piece, because we, I mean, there are definitely elements of, of The Shining that show up in it, and without spoiling anything for the folks who've only seen the pilot, um, it, it directs you to a sort of ending in, in the first season, or, or something near to the ending in the first season. So uh, do you feel like that that reference material, um, was, it, was it freeing to have that framework, or was it uh, constricting, and where do you go after that? season two i mean is it gonna be like i, I, I gotta be the, i'll answer the the second question no idea no idea at all probably <laughs> okay. a lot of improv um seeing as these guys know their characters so well um no i think it's i think it's only helpful you know i um my last show i did which was omitted veronica's closet took its place in my resume apparently uh was a show <laughs> called trial and error which was uh loosely and not litigatably uh based on the staircase and uh, it actually really helps to have a framework. I think, um, I mean, this is a bigger question about writing. And, you know, I've written, before this, I've written only sitcoms. And, you know, everybody for years complained, oh, you can't curse in a sitcom. And, and this show, as I've pointed out, has more curses than The Wire. But it also, the curses are, are not just for laughs. The curses are just because cursing is a sign of mental illness. Um, and that was supposed to be in the original thing. I think it got cut out, but there were other things that are, you know, signs of mental illness, uh, or possession also. There's a lot of overlap there. So I think using the, the shining, we wanted to make sure that this was never like scary movie or, or a, um, a parody or a spoof. 
Um, but I think having that framework and, and don't forget the, the shining is, is also an allegory, you know, it's an allegory for spousal abuse, which I learned from my writers. Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it happens to a lot of it. it when I was, when I was writing, I've watched the shining a couple of times. I have the, a few times I have the, the, the screenplay here as well. And, um, you know, it's just the, a lot of the issues are the same between Jack and Wendy. So I think it was kind of fortuitous, like when I was when I was writing the last episode and I kind of knew how it would end. But like when I saw that last fight that they had and I saw that his mental breakdown and I saw the dynamic, I was like, wow, this is really we've really built this in nicely. Like this is like really a Pat and Terry dynamic. The the specifics change. But I think it's I think it's it's great. It's liberating. Anytime you have constraints, then, you know, you have boundaries. I think I think it's I think it's easier. You know what I got from that whole intelligent, thoughtful answer? The the uh, image of Courtney being in scary movie, which would make Scream fans lose their minds. I, if, uh, I, I heard. You know, <laughs> <laughs> just just to just to, to back that. You know, the, everybody asks if I wrote this for Courtney, and the answer is ultimately yes. Um, I didn't know it; she knew it before I knew it. Um, but you know, one of the hesitations I had candidly about Courtney was that she's such a she is the the franchise face of Scream, and we wanted to make sure that we weren't doing Scream because Scream has you know that we really trying to like Greg you know alluded to this like we're really trying to find a niche here of of like a serious family drama comedy with horror elements, and we didn't want it to be spoofy. But I love references just because honestly it, it makes it easier also to to you know when you have uh, Greg as uh, as 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 Wendy. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, <laughs> it's perfect. Um, you know, you don't really, <laughs> 90% of your work is done. Um, but you know, I was, I was, I, I didn't want that. I didn't want to have the scream. And, and that's why, you know, Sharon and I talked about Courtney early on and like, well, that's, that's, she does scream. And then when I reconnected with Courtney and, and, you know, kind of saw her, you know, now, um, you know, her, her personal life and, and spoke to her and, and her kind of passion for the project. I was like, wow, that is just, that is one tiny, tiny, uh, layer of the onion is that. And, and we could see that Courtney has dug deep in the season, the second season. Um, yes, I do have a, uh, a different classic movie that I'm going to be, um, kind of using as a framework and we're going to be, uh, digging in, way way deeper into new territory for uh for pat for terry he has a gigantic arc this season per his contract and um also um it, everybody does i don't know how we're going to do it. it's unshootable but um it's it we're going to go so deep and so you know much further i mean really season one was the launching point and it's it's so exciting to me um uh, courtney you've spoken quite a bit about the uh, the layers of the character and Sharon Horgan said uh, of you she's not playing herself in any way it's a real transformation which I guess is comforting considering some of the things that, <laughs> that Pat does uh, so uh, do you agree I mean what are the points of, of Pat that you feel are, are farthest from you and where do you intersect well the parts that are the most similar are obviously what she's going through as far as menopause or I mean I'm not but uh and well never but uh you know just her age and dealing with um there have been times in my career that I, there were really you know I was I felt stuck so um I'm divorced uh so that's also I've been through marital problems um I've never moved out of the state and tried to start my life over or addiction but I just I was so attracted to this character for so many ways but I will say um, her sense of humor is, I would say it's a little more like I'm a little drier than the characters I've played. And, um, but just the layers that she has and everything she's going through. And, oh, I can do another thing that's this similar is that I have a teenage daughter um, who's, you know, at that age where she's pushing me away. I don't have a son mm -hmm. and he's incredible too. Um, but just everything I give, the mental health is something I can't, you know, I just really tried to learn as much as I could. And, um, just delve myself into a character that I've never done before and, and this and dealing with this many things. So um, I love the relationship that I have with, well, Pat and Terry, I think is fantastic and so layered and to play comedy and drama 
and horror at the same time. It's just, I've never done it before in this way. Um, you know, if you take Scream, it's definitely a horror film. And it's funny, but it's not real. And they don't deal with serious subjects like this. So, and then it's, you know, it's not dramatic. I mean, although there's some, I don't want to, there's a few moments, but not in my character. I, I think I think uh, Miss Cox is, is selling herself short here on just how deep she's delved into this. I mean, the thing, you know, Sharon and I, when we were looking to cast this, uh, at one point I said, we have to hire, we have to hire, we have to cast a mother because I don't think anybody mm. knows horror like a parent, you know? <laughs> and I have two teenage kids who are nothing like this. Greg's kids are mm. beyond uh, highly functioning. It makes me a little bit annoyed, but uh, I'm sure there's some kind of chink in that armor too. Um, but, um, you know, it was, um, it was really Courtney when I saw Courtney with her daughter and again, they don't have the same relationship, but the, the one thing I always love to see, and again, I'll take this out of the Courtney is I love to see like powerful, successful people who are destroyed by their kids in terms of like kids know exactly, and my kids do it also, not that I'm putting myself in the same league, but kids know exactly what to say to hurt you at any given time. And I love that. And I think that you need to be a parent to, to take that. And, and I also think, you know, one of the difficult things was on the page is that Pat is not necessarily a classically likable character. She's an addict. She curses a lot. She's not a great mom. Um, she cheated on her husband and they said, how are we going to make her likable? And again, because it's, because it's, you know, streaming, um, I guess that, that bar is a little less. When I worked on old Christine, we constantly got the note that she's not likable. And it's like, of course she's likable. It's Julia. Um, mm -hmm. but for this, for Pat is really, there's really not that much. I mean, she's, she's, she's vain. She's completely broken. Um, but then we're like, okay, so we have Courtney Cox and people love Courtney Cox, but then we cast Greg as Terry and he brought such a warmth and depth to the character. And I remember Greg and I having a conversation in the beginning. He's like, why do you stay with her? He said, why do I stay with her? And I said, because, um, you love her. And I think that love really kept the family together. And it, it really, it put such a safety net on it for me. Like in the pilot, one of the things I just loved about like watching the two of them fight, it actually brought me back to some some personal moments. But, um, you know, it it really you were never afraid that it was going to get dangerous. And that's why when it does get dangerous, I think it's it's so it's so shocking and also so just heartfelt. And I think that's really just a tribute to to Greg and Courtney, who just just crushed it in that way. Yes, I feel like you're. Like I inadvertently screen shared your, it's uh, it's like you're looking at my notes and you just listed off a bunch of things I wanted to ask you guys about. I'm actually specific. looking at your notes. Damn I'm sorry, we, was I not supposed to have that screen? <laughs> uh, you know, the uh, Greg, I want to get to Terry uh, in a moment, but since you brought up likability, <clears throat> that, that's something I want to talk about. That in terms of the complexity of the character, something that that uh, I think a lot of actors are would be kind of afraid to do is to uh, to play a character who's not exactly like I mean she doesn't do I'm sure that a lot of people can relate but as you said she does some things that are, are kind of hard to take especially because we like Terry Terry seems like a a, a pretty good dude and and she does some stuff <laughs> yeah. oh gosh I can't talk about that because that's a spoiler but when we we see them in a parallel situation the choice he right. makes versus the choice she makes you know uh but yeah uh well, let's talk about that bugaboo of likability for a second. And I do think it has to do with streaming that, uh, you know, the, the content doors have been kicked open. And so uh, we we're seeing stories and characters that, that we wouldn't have seen, you know, when the gatekeepers would say, Christine has to be more likable, even if she's Julia right. Uh So what do you guys think about that? Courtney, uh, uh, um, Courtney, Greg, what do you, what do you guys think about that bar? Do you feel like, um, that's not such a concern for you anymore. That that you can play characters uh, with with fewer restraints than before. I mean, I, I think so. But also because this character is going through such real um, things that people can relate to. I mean, like a broken marriage and 
all the things we talked about before, it's, you know, you see her sadness. It's not just like she has no empathy or um, she's a narcissist to the place where she's like, I just wanted to have an affair. You could see she was breaking down and because of her addiction and her writer's block and all the things and just having a life that she actually says, you know, every single day is exactly the same. And I think people can relate to this character more than it would be just a, a you know, a person who's completely selfless. And, uh, you know, I'm, she's not a sociopath. And then she's actually possessed. Or I don't know if I'm not supposed to say that either. But, you know, she meets Mira Servino, her character, and she has to deal. I don't, I just, I think that she is weirdly relatable. And, and I think people can see that. But I think there has to be a warmth there. I, I again, um, I, I, I agree. You know, it's it, it, candidly, and Sharon's not going to see this right now. Um, <laughs> but like one of one of the issues I had with the the show, just on the page, and again, this was you know Sharon's original idea, and I, and I ran with it and built out the characters and stuff. And you know, Sharon is obviously you know there's a reason there's a co next to my uh, creator title, and and Sharon is generous enough to uh, let me share that with her is that her characters for me tend to be a little bit darker. And in the beginning, you know, it's funny. I, uh, recently I went back to the original pages that, that uh, she shared with me and, you know, the family was a lot more broken and a lot more dysfunctional and, and, um, you know, and she could write that better than I can. And since this was mine, uh, since she was kind of, you know, handing over the reins to me, I needed to find, something I was more comfortable with and a certain stability uh, to it. And I couldn't just have, you know, the daughter couldn't just be, you know, a slut and the kid, you know, and the, and the son just couldn't be in his room, you know, uh, mm. watching violent video games and the door and the wife couldn't just be, you know, mm. and the husband just couldn't be an idiot and the wife couldn't just be, you know, just this live wire um, out of control. And, and I think for me really what grounded it was, seeing how much Terry loved her and that, again, that was a safety net. And that was something that, like, I think that's kind of the fantasy element of it. You know, going back to, you know, my storytelling route is the roots, the, the fantasy element of it is, is that you can survive something like this. Because I think there's a lot, you know, again, there's a lot of mental illness, especially now, and we see it played out in horrific ways. And I think that there's, you know, she's actually you know, in, in a relatively safe way, uh, <laughs> Pat is expressing herself. But um, anyway, again, it goes back to casting. Relatively safe, without spoiling. <laughs> um, Greg, you've, you've been so patient this whole time, uh, but I'm, I'm really glad that Jeff uh, uh, mentioned, you know, the, the challenge, uh, uh, what I think of as the acting challenge for you, the main one of, of uh, what keeps you there? Uh, I mean, it's kind of hard to imagine that, Pat was an awesome life partner before this, before uh, what Courtney has admitted is possession. Um, and uh, and the guy has choices. I mean, he's you know he's got a good job, he's a good looking dude, whatever. Um, so what's the hook for him? What what keeps him there? Well, um, I, first of all, just going back to your earlier comment about how streaming's changed things or not changed things. I mean, I. You know, I, I don't think streaming creates the opportunity to be more unlikable for characters. I think the plausibility and reality of these things has to exist. I, you're talking to a guy who loved uh, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf. I don't have to have likable characters to enjoy the entertainment. Um, but when the idea of Courtney kind of going through all of this, uh, you know, when it was brought to me, she was doing this. And I was like, well, there's there's a giant caveat there with her because there is a, a presence and a warmth there that I, uh, you know, that I instantly saw as something that I, you know, I'd want to protect. And I think for, uh, for Terry, that at the end of the day, he's, he is definitely, um, uh, you know, he's trying to, you know, get through something. He, he, he's not, a victim, and yet he—I uh, I don't think he's playing a victim, and yet he has like he's got to have some PS, uh, PTSD after the the marriage to this woman, and and the conversations that we had from the get go was, well, what is it? And and I do think that it's great fun to, or a challenge even to to play opposite a person who is a complete wrecking ball, who's who's 
who's being destroyed, um, uh, you know, in a couple of different ways. And the, the lack of certainty of what is, you know, breaking her down, um, and, and also wanting to kind of propel the marriage forward at all costs to keep the family together. I, you know, there is that value system. I don't think that, you know, I, everybody, there, there is a, a lot of, uh, people who opt to the, you know, divorce checkout, um, done with this marriage option quickly and easily. And I think there is a subsect of people who, whether it was the way they were brought up or whatever is, is are determined, uh, to hold, to, to hold the line, um, that, that, that marriage, that idea of that, that keeping that marriage together at all costs, almost at, at times creating more damage than is necessary. Maybe they'd be better opting out, but there are those that, you know, want to stay together. And I think that's the case, you know, with Terry, that he loves her. Um, he loves his family and he loves, I think he's a, um, he, as Jeff said, there's a fantasy element of what he wants to hold together. Mm-hmm. So borderline delusional, borderline, uh, you know, trying to be a decent, you know, uh, get through a decent marriage as per the assignment. Uh, it's a fine line, but I, I applaud his, uh, his efforts. And it's great fun to play against that, you know, because what they, they keep surprising me with what, um, what Pat is capable of in terms of uh, her damage, and uh, and and somehow he uh, he's managing to at least through the end of the series um, somewhat hold it together until he's not. Uh, there's so many things I want to ask you. We're we're running out of time. I, mean, I wanted to talk to you. I want to talk about uh, Mira's character um, and how I, I think that she's kind of a representation of synchronicity, but. Uh, She's going to burst through. If you say Mira three times, she will come through the screen. (laughs) Mira, Mira, Mira. Uh, I turn into Mira. Mira. Yes. Uh, Yeah, I mean, she said said such insightful things about the the character. Uh, uh, She knows that character better than anybody knows anything. Um, She's the most articulate person ever. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Very smart. uh, Okay, well, talking about her a little bit, uh, without spoiling anything for the people who haven't seen the entire thing, uh, I think we can admit that she... She's uh, a supernatural presence. Uh, and she's, she's talked about the difference between spiritual rosemary and real rosemary and spiritual rosemary manifesting as this kind of 1950s TV ideal housewife. But, uh, you know, real rosemary being um, desperate and repressed. But the, uh, I, feel like, I feel like she expresses the, the, one of the root ideas of the show, this, uh, because I feel like she's trying to free Pat's id, that she, yeah. her... Her repressed real life gets expressed in these like violent, rageful ways. It's like the way Sting represented synchronicity in the uh, in some synchronicity too. How crazy am I for thinking that? I, I don't think you're 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 not the first person who's compared her to Sting. Uh, and, <laughs> uh, synchronicity. There was some Phil Collins. It was one Phil Collins, rep- you know, reference. But I think Sting is mostly what we say. Uh, she's based a character on. Um, you know, it's very, very interesting. Uh, her character. I think that was the character that I developed the most from the from the pages. You know, she was. Um, I turned her into a fifties housewife because I I love. Um, I just love the the notion of of basically how women's roles throughout kind of societal times and, and, you know, how they're, what seems like the good old days and what seems like, you know, were those the good days, were those the bad days? I think objectively people look at a fifties housewife as somebody who's repressed and just who would love nothing more than to live Pat's life. And Pat is horrible at her life in, in this era. Um, and, um, you know, Mira, basically we had, she was almost like, you know, the, the, it just without talking, you know, numbers in the budget, basically, you know, I think we had more for Roxy than we did for the Rosemary character. And because just like, you know, this was like a, a this was mostly a two hander and then, um, you know, and the kids and it was going to be the family. And then, you know, Mira took the job after we, we talked extensively about where her character went and, um, you know, she took the job with one line. Oscar winner Mira Sorino took the <laughs> job. She has one line in the pilot. and um, But we discussed where it went. And she basically, 
love that evolution. You know, she's got her own mirrors, got her own stuff that she'll happily talk about that, that, that she has, you know, it's a redemption story. It's a redemption story for Pat. It's a redemption story for Rosemary in, um, you know, it, it's in season two, we really, really explore the kind of the, the roots of, of this whole thing. And, and, you know, and talk about why we talk about why the marriage, why they're in that house and also why, um, Terry married Pat. Um, we go a little more into his side of it, but for Mira, you know, she said to me when I told her character, she was on board until I said, Oh, and then she does this horrible thing. And with her family, she goes, no, 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 no. I, I don't think she should do that. What if she didn't? I was like, well, that's kind of where the story goes. And she's like, nah, I don't think it does. I said, I know it does. <laughs> and <laughs> she said, but I want her to be likable. And I said, and that, that's where we kind of came with the two elements of, of Rosemary as the victim and also Rosemary as the um, antagonist. And, um, you know, and, and we, I learned the difference with, from my horror writers about the difference between a ghost and a demon and, and that really, once we kind of, you know, elucidated that. But, but it should be clear that, you know, the, and, and this came up actually another segment we had where people asked what it was like uh, for Oscar nominee Greg Kinnear to be working with Oscar winner uh, <laughs> Mira Serino, and uh, they said they didn't work together. And I realized, right. like, oh my god, they had no scenes together. And it's so the whole thing. If you watch it from the beginning, this was the intent: is that it could all have been played through Pat's psychosis. So there is no, we are not guaranteeing that she is uh, otherworldly. Okay, on that note, uh, thank you guys so much for being here. I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, your answers were really good. Bunch of questions I didn't even get to because you had such good answers. So uh, thank you very much, Jeff Astroff, Courtney Cox, Greg Kinnear of Shining Vale. Um, and thanks to all of you for tuning in to this edition of Envelope Live. Yes. See you thank, you. thank you so much. Great seeing you guys. <laughs>